thank you all so much for coming. I want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library for sponsoring tonight's program and sponsoring all our programs here at the library for adults, teens, and kids. We're a very active programming library. We run one, sometimes two programs a day for adults here. And it's all thanks to the generosity of the Friends of the Library. Uh, we're hosting living history performances uh, every Tuesday night at 6.30 this summer. Uh, some will be outside and some will be indoors. Uh, and next week, we are hosting Amelia Earhart. Ooh. I found her, folks. She's alive. She's, she's, she's real. <laughs> she, uh, uh, big, big news, big news. So uh, she'll be with us uh, next uh, Tuesday, 6.30, uh, likely on the back lawn. We'll see what the weather's like. Uh, so if anyone has any cell phones on them, they want to turn those to vibrator silence. I said this last week. And someone's phone went off. I don't mind saying that because they're not in the room. So let's make sure that we have our phones on silent or vibrate. Restrooms are down the hall on the right before you get to the front desk. Uh, if you need it, trash and recycling is in the back. Uh, I anticipate this program lasting approximately an hour or so. That includes the performance, the Q&A, and a little bit of show and tell. So we should probably all get out of here around 7.30 or so. And I also want to plug our Adult Summer Reading Challenge. There are uh, newsletters across from the front desk if anyone is out of the loop. But we are giving away, for like 63 straight days, we're giving away a $10 Donna's Donut gift card every day to our Adult Summer, one lucky uh, reader uh, uh, in our Adult Summer Reading Challenge. So in other words, we're pulling 63 names, there's 63 winners, you can win a $10 gift card to the best donut place in town, okay? Uh, and then in addition, there are some grand prizes that include a $50 gift certificate to Max Ice Cream, $50 gift certificate to Meadowlands Ice Cream, and $50 gift certificate to Dandelion's Ice Cream. So between donuts and ice cream, can you, can you figure out which staff member was in charge of the prizes? <laughs> <laughs> you, you got it, you got it. But I do want to thank Donna, because so Donna's actually donated all their gift cards. They donated almost $600 worth of gift cards to us, so we really appreciate that, absolutely. So if you haven't already, please sign up. It's all online this year. We weren't quite sure what COVID was going to do to us. So everything's online, it's super simple, and we're not logging um, uh, books or pages or hours or minutes, it's just days. So if you read that day, then you're good to go for that day. So all you gotta do is log in and let us know if you've read that day. So we're keeping it super simple this year. Okay, I've laughed on enough. Hopefully anyone who went to the back lawn is now able to come to the library in the room. So uh, I'll give it a few extra minutes here. Okay, so let's see if I can do this without blushing. Okay, I think I'm gonna fail, but here we go. So, uh, local historian Irene Axelrod is here with us to, to, to tonight uh, to perform as Lydia Pink, a Massachusetts inventor and marketer of an herbal alcoholic women's tonic for menstrual and menopausal problems. Pinkham was a successful patent medicine proprietor who claimed that her vegetable compound could cure any female complaint from nervous prostration to a prolapsed uterus. Once one of the most famous women in America, Pinkham was the first woman to have her picture advertising her own product. Her products were sold worldwide and can still be found in stores where healthcare products are sold. Uh, Irene, uh, and I forgot to mention something that I should have, I want to thank Tewksbury Telemedia for filming tonight's event, and we are live folks, so Jason is just focused on Irene, but I just want to let folks know in the room that we are recording, and everything is focused up front. I should have done that at the beginning, so a little disclaimer there. So Irene here hails from Pickham Town of Lynn, where she's a, you ready for this? We gotta stick together, Irene. Retired librarian from Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum, and she now works at the House of Seven Gables. Uh, after the play, audience members will be able to view some of the original advertising items that Pinkham successfully used. Uh, so all 30 of us or so here in the room, and I'm sure the thousands that are watching live on Twitch Story Telemedia, let's give a big round of applause to Irene for joining us here tonight. Thanks so much. 
Thank you, everyone. I will correct one thing that Robert said. I'm actually a retired librarian, but I am on the board at the House of the Seven Gables, where I did work for nine years, and then at the Phillips Library at the Peabody Essex Museum. So it's always great to be in a library, and I'm pretty happy to be inside, and I want to thank all of you as well for being here, and all of the folks in Tewksbury who came together to make this program possible. And I will say, between the ice cream and the donuts, I'm ready to move to Tewksbury. <laughs> so Lydia Pinkham, how many people here have heard of Lydia Pinkham? Great, nearly everybody. Well, if we were gathered, say, 120 or so years ago, you all would have heard of Lydia Pinkham, and some of you might actually be taking her medicine. So how this works tonight is I'm starting off as myself, and uh, as I said, glad to be here. And I got started doing Lydia Pinkham presentations in 1997. There's a man in Salem named Jim McAllister. He's the official historian of Salem. And he was doing Wednesday night programs at the Lyceum restaurant. Some of you may have eaten there at one time or another. And he was getting a little bit burnt out, so he started to recruit his friends to do programs for him or with him. And he said to me, you're from Lynn. You should know about Lydia Pinkham. Go look her up and come back to me and we'll have a program. So in the spring of 1997, I did Lydia Pinkham for the first time. But I did it in kind of a lecture form. So he said, you know, change it. You're doing third person to be a lot more interesting if you did it in first person. And you said, I instead of she. So. I made that change. I found it was actually easier than I thought. I do have notes because I don't always remember up here all the stories that I want to tell you, and I want to make sure I tell you all of them before we're done. Now, Lydia was born on February 9, 1819, in Lynn, Massachusetts. She was the tenth of 12 children. Her parents were Re Rebecca and William Estes, and they traced their ancestry all the way back to Italy, to the Esti family. And then in 1676, Matthew Estes, who had lived in England, emigrated to America. The, the Estes families were Quakers from way back, and that becomes quite significant later on in the story of Lydia Pinkham. The f my father, William, was a shoemaker. He dabbled in some other things, too. Lynn, at that point, was already known as the city of shoes. During the War of 1812, he built a salt works, and he found that made more money than working on shoes. He also made a fortune in real estate. By the 1830s, my family had left the Quaker meeting. Now, there were several reasons for that. The Lynn Friends Society refused to endorse the abolition of, sa of slavery. So we were called come outers because we came out of the meeting. Lynn was a center at this point for reform movements, abolition, temperance, spiritualism. And my home was a gathering place, especially for the anti-slavery movement. Leaders like William Lloyd Garrison, Lydia Maria Child, Wendell Phillips, John Greenleaf Whittier, Abby Kelly, and of course, Frederick Douglass. Now, in, at the age of 16, I joined the Lynn Female Anti-Slavery Society, and right away they named me as the secretary of that group. My mother and my sisters also were members. My sister, Julielma, was a very good friend of Frederick Douglass. And she, at one time, after we'd left the Quaker meeting and she'd joined the Methodist Church, was walking down Union Street, that's a street in the center of Lynn. She took his arm and walked. And she had to leave the Methodist Church because they objected to that. Now, in 1842, the Lynn Lyceum, which was 
a place where people could come and do talks, much like I'm doing tonight, they barred Charles Lennox Ramond of Salem. So we started a new organization called the Freeman's Institute. And not only were men members of this group, but women were too. Now the motto of the group was no concealment, no compromise. I had graduated with honors from the Lynn Academy, and it was somewhat unusual in my young days for a girl to go all the way through high school, never mind to graduate with honors. Frederick Douglass comes back into the picture again about this time. He was warned not to give a scheduled lecture. My sisters and I put on our Quaker clothes, which we had put away when we came out of the meeting, and we escorted him down the street safely, and he delivered his lecture. A debating society was also formed, and again, I was elected secretary. The questions that we considered were these. Has the institution of church organization been beneficial to mankind? Has the institution of clergy been beneficial to mankind? Have the missionary enterprises of the professed friends of the church been productive of good? Is there conclusive proof that the whole human race has descended from a common origin? Has the human race been from its origin productive? Is the institution of the state subversive of the rights of man? Is the individual under any obligation to sustain the institution of the state, or may he at pleasure withdraw from it? Some rather controversial topics, I'd say. Could society exist and flourish if all punishment were abolished? Which state of society is preferable? That which now exists? an absolute community of property and interest, or an association which admits of individual ownership of property, included in that of the community? Is it the rightful prerogative of man to exercise control over women? Ought the right of suffrage to be extended to women? Now, one of the newcomers to Lynn at this point was a man named Isaac Pinkham. Now, he and I were married in 1843. He came from Dover, New Hampshire, and there was a saying there, never bother a Pinkham when he is thinking. <laughs> he had been in the business of selling whale oil. When we met, he had become a shoe manufacturer. He was 29 and I was 24 when we met. He was quiet, he was polite, he saw business opportunities around every corner. He began to invest in real estate, much as my father had done. He bought enough land, people began to address him as Squire Pinkham. Our three sons were born in Lynn. Charles in 1844, Daniel in 1849, and William in 1852. Our youngest child and only daughter, Araline, was born in 1857 on a farm in Bedford. We lived for a few years when Isaac had decided to try farming. It didn't work out. But the real estate business had also failed. When finances improved somewhat, we moved back to Lynn. We had a strict budget. All four children graduated at the head of their Lynn High School classes winning medals and honors along the way. The boys did odd jobs for neighbors, sold popcorn, and sometimes worked at fairs. I helped them with their lessons, drilled them in spelling, and coached them in what we call declamation. You'd know it as speech. I was able to assist our neighbors, especially the women, in matters of health. Open windows, frequent bathing, healthy eating were all my recommendations. Not too popular at that time. I also had experience in and knowledge of home remedies. 
I kept scrapbooks of articles from periodicals, from newspapers, and also from medical books. My mother had kept herbs and plants drying in the attic as I was growing up, and she had taught me all that she knew. Now, Isaac had some rules about success in business, and we'll see as we move on how well he and the rest of the family followed these. Make all your purchases as far as possible of those who stand the highest in uprightness and integrity, men of character. Enter into no business arrangements with anyone unless you're well satisfied that such a person is governed by a strict sense of honor and justice. Engage of, in nothing of business at arm's length and be sure you are well acquainted with whatever business you may engage in. Be satisfied with doing well and continue well doing. A sure sixpence is better than a doubtful shilling, which motto be governed by. I leave it to each of you to judge how well we obeyed these rules. Now, the recipe for the vegetable compound, and we have some bottles, empty bottles, except for one, over on the table. The recipe was never a secret. I know that was a rumor when it first came out, but I can give you the recipe right now. Eight ounces of unicorn root, six ounces of life root, black cohosh, pleurisy root, also six ounces, fenugreek seed, and alcohol, 18%. Now, alcohol was used as a solvent and a preservative, and for medicinal purposes only. The re recipe came as payment of a debt. Isaac used to sign notes for people, and one of the notes was called in, the person couldn't pay it, and so he gave him, gave my husband the recipe instead. Now, my son Dan, who had suffered from ill health throughout his early life, went to Texas, worked as a cattle drover, and then as a teacher. As I said, his health was not good. So he came home to Lynn, and he opened a grocery store. The grocery store became a gathering place to discuss and debate the issues of the day. Unfortunately, the grocery store failed because Dan refused to sell alcohol. We were temperance people, remember. <sighs> Will hoped to enter Harvard, but the Panic of 1873 changed his plans, as well as the lives of all of our family. Charles had left school early to help support the family. He served in the Civil War, having enlisted at the age of 17, right out of high school, and he sometimes walked to work to save the train fare. Now, in 1872, our family fortunes were good. Property values had gone up. Isaac listed himself as a builder, having sold his kerosene business. In 1873, however, banks failed, depression came. And as I said, notes that Isaac had signed were called in. And at the same time, his health failed. The grocery store, as I said, had closed. Dan had declared bankruptcy. Charles took a job on the railroad as a conductor, and Araline taught school. Isaac and I, at this point, had been married for 30 years. We moved once again to another smaller house, and we would have often family meetings, so we sat down for one to decide how we could continue to support ourselves. Our habit was to decide unanimously on a course of action. As we sat down, two women from Salem drove up in a carriage. They were looking for my vegetable compound. They had heard about it, and they offered to pay $5 for six bottles. Now, I was used to giving my medicine away. I just wanted to help people. So I reluctantly accepted this offer. But I had always told people, I wanted to help them, especially women, to be healthy, to avoid going to doctors whenever possible. 
after the women left, Dan said, Mother, if those ladies will come all the way from Salem to get that medicine, why can it not be sold to other people? Why can't we go into the business of making and selling it, same as any other medicine? At first I said no, but the rest of my family thought it was a good idea. They wanted to call it Lydia E. Pinkham's Vegetable Compound, and this became a family venture. All of the children put some money towards buying ingredients. I was the treasurer and general manager. I also was the one who made the medicine in our basement kitchen. After we purchased our food, we then began to pay for advertising, handbills, you'd call them flyers today, I think. The boys distributed these. I wrote the copy for the handbills, the labels, and a four-page folder called A Guide for Women. I called myself, as I was, an untitled woman who has no higher ambition than to do good for others. We called the product the greatest medical discovery since the dawn of history. <laughs> Women said the compound helped their aching backs. It beats all, Dan said. The people said we, say we will be rich. My main occupation, as I said, was to make the product. We had a cellar kitchen, I combined ingredients, and in the evening, the family would fill the bottles. Isaac would read aloud while we worked, so everyone had their task. We packed the bottles for shipment in second-hand boxes obtained from a local grocer. One day, in 1875, the mailman delivered a check for $16. My sons talked about giving up their jobs and working full time to sell the compound. Dad decided to go to New York City. Each son had different talents. Dan was the aggressive one. That's why he was going to New York City, I think. Charlie had the level head. Will was charming. And Araline was the school teacher. In May 1876, Dan arrived in New York with 20,000 handbills. He had the idea of putting my photograph on the labels and in the advertising. After some discussion, I put on my cameo pin and my lace collar and had my photograph taken. So my face appeared on all those handbills, as well as on the product labels. Now this was at a time women's names were not supposed to be printed, never mind their photograph. Only when you were born, married, or died were these names supposed to be publicized. Will visited the Boston Herald office after collecting $84 from an order for the compound. The advertising manager quoted a price of $60 for an advertisement, and Will made the deal. The family was upset, but the typesetter made an error. The advertisement appeared over every column in the paper. Orders came in from three different wholesalers as well as from individuals. We hired an agent. Dan came back and forth from New York. He went everywhere he could to distribute handbills, pamphlets, and to make deals with pharmacists. His letters home were addressed to dear doctors and were full of encouragement, sometimes scoldings, to work harder, sell more, and send him money. In 1878, he came home and ran for office as a representative to the state legislature. He won having Warren on a temperance platform. A local paper asked, how does Dan Pinkham expect his mother to keep her roots and herbs without alcohol? We answered, as usual, alcohol was used as a solvent and a preservative for the other ingredients. And his use, of course, was purely medicinal. Other people wrote testimonials, and these were unsolicited, to say how much the compound helped them. I have been a sufferer for years from weakness, back pain, fatigue. The compound has cured all my weaknesses. In the early days, I answered all these letters myself. 
the task became overwhelming. First, I got my daughter and my daughter-in-law to help with the letters, and soon they learned my style of, of responding. And then, it still was too much, we hired women, and we called them typewriters. All responses ended, yours for health. They began, dear friend, and advertising now bore the words, we can trust her, and many women did. No more doctors for me. I got quite well and have your compound to thank. I went to see a doctor. He said little could be done. I took medicine prescribed by a doctor, but it did me no good. No more doctors for me. As the product sold more, the advertising found new sites, fences, sides of buildings, even barns. Songs began to be written. Tell me, Lydia, of your secrets and the wonders you perform, how you take the sick and ailing and restore them to the norm. Mrs. Jones of Walla Walla, Mrs. Smith of Kankakee, Mrs. Cohen, Mrs. Murphy, sing your praises lustily. Lizzie Smith had tired feelings. Terrible pain reduced her weight. She began to take the compound. Now she weighs 308. <laughs> and here's another. Oh, we'll sing of Lydia Pinkham and her love for the human race. How she sells her vegetable compound and the papers, the papers, they publish her face. The company prospered, but my family faced personal tragedies. Now by 1881, sales had reached $200,000 a year. But, and I'm coming back to you as Irene now, Dan, who had returned to New York after he lost his campaign for re-election, came home with a cough. Lydia tried to cure him with the products that she had. He went south, hoping that the warm weather would help, as it had when he was much younger. But he died in October of 1881, a month before his 33rd birthday. And the family scarcely had time to mourn him. Will contracted, as they called it then, consumption, tuberculosis actually, early in 1881. He died in Los Angeles after having just been married. His new bride was by his side, two months after Dan, at the age of 28. And this double blow shattered Lydia Pinkham. On December 23, 1882, she had a stroke. She died on May 17, 1883, at the age of 64. So the family did not for very long get to enjoy their newfound prosperity. Okay, does anyone have any questions? I have, I have a little story to tell about. Okay, would you like to come up? No, uh, <laughs> anyway, in 1965, when you were talking, when you first got married, you came to, you went to Bedford? Yes. Well, I lived in Bedford. Mm-hmm. And in 1965, there, it, there was a place years ago that was um, a hotel, and they, people came there for their waters, and the road was called Sweetwater Ave, mm -hmm. and it had healing. The water on this pond had healing things. And I went to work in this fat old factory that made, they said, Lydia Pinkham. Oh. And it, what I remember about the um, building was there were big, big vats mm -hmm. that were sort of like an open casket size. That's all I, that's uh, all I, I just wanted to say that. That's interesting. I don't know if that, it was a Lydia Pinkham mm -hmm. that was made in the, that factory. But it was an electronics place when I was there. Sure. Way back. Yeah, My question was what happened to the company after? Uh, after, uh, <laughs> well, the family, there were then two children left of the four original ones. Charles became the president, and Aroline became the treasurer. 
And then their children came along after that, and the children didn't see eye to eye as to how to manage this thing. There is, there is a building in Lynn on Western Ave that, that's known as the Pinkham Factory. Now, they may have had other offshoots of that, and I don't know. That's a, that's a very interesting thing, especially with the Bedford connection. Uh, so the, anyhow, Aroline and Charles, until I think he died in 1900, she some years after that. The children had a falling out. Uh, the company was sold several times, and uh, the first time it was sold went to a company called Cooper Labs. It was owned by Johnson & Johnson for a brief while, and then another company called RUS bought it. And you can actually still buy Lydia Pinkham products. Uh, a lot of the stuff that's on the table there came from eBay, but eBay also sells the original medicine. I've also seen it in you know, health, food, and vitamin stores. So it, it's still around. It's still got her picture on the label, just as it did back in the, in the early days. Have you tried it now? No. <laughs> no. And I think, that, I think one, there's one bottle there in, in the box, and it, the stuff looks very dark. What I, what I have been told is it tastes something like Moxie, if you remember the old tonic. I know my mother used to take it, because I used to see it in the house. And I guess there are still people taking it today. At some point, and I think it was in the 19-teens or possibly just before Prohibition, the FDA stepped in and said, you can't have 18% alcohol in this. You have. So they cut it down, I think, first to 15% and then to about 10%. Yes? I just want to give a plug for the Public Health Museum in Tewksbury. If you're interested in Lydia Pinkham and, and her um, what was called a patent medicine. Yes. You have an exhibit there, and Lydia Pinkham's there. And, oh. You know, during the tour, we do mention Lydia Pinkham because she is local. She's famous. I, she certainly, as I started to say at the beginning of the presentation, she was probably the most famous woman in America. Now, at this point, probably a lot of people haven't heard of her, but that picture was everywhere. And, and I guess sometimes people were fans and sometimes they were not. She also got some letters that said, please change your hair and get rid of that that iron smile, someone called it. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. Even, to today, even if today there's a building in downtown Salem, Massachusetts, brick yes. building, I think it's on Washington. It's on Derby. Derby Street, yeah. Yeah. In the corner. yeah. And it's like, it, it, by its appearance, it dates from the early 20th century. Yep. Yep. So, do you know about that? I do, and, uh, and I'm glad you brought that up. I don't always like to tell everything I know because I like to give people a chance to ask questions. But it is a memorial clinic to Lydia Pinkham, and it was started by her daughter, Aroline, who wanted some kind of a memorial to her mother other than the business itself. And she actually worked to start it with a woman named Caroline Emerton, who founded the House of the Seven Gables, where I used to work. And the clinic is still going today, and it's to help young mothers and their babies. It started off, I think, around the time of the flu epidemic, 100 or so years ago, to help women who were bringing babies into the world and needed fresh milk and needed a doctor to, to check the babies out and needed uh, care for themselves. And it's only open, you know, very short hours, like Tuesday and Thursday from 12.30 to 2.30. And I went there to visit some years ago and hoped to find a written history of the place and they didn't have that but I I think it's it's very interesting I think it's fascinating that it's such a lasting institution and it is still helping people you know more, more than a hundred years after its first founding so thank you for bringing that up yes it used to actually vaccinate children before vaccinations were provided ah. generally I see. So, vax, I don't know if everyone heard that. They also used to vaccinate children. Anybody else? Well, I would like to invite you all to come up, 
have a look around the table. I'll be there if you have any questions. There's an assortment of Pinkham related uh, products and things that I've collected over the years. So come on up.